Good evening, I'm A.J. Wilson, and welcome to the DNR's live deer event. For the next hour, you will have an opportunity to ask a question via DNR's Facebook page related to anything deer. Just post your question, and our panel of experts will answer as many as they can. We also will direct you to other resources where you can find much of the information my guest will share with you tonight, along with additional background on Michigan's outstanding natural resources. Now let me introduce the panel. First, our first panel member is DNR's Assistant Chief Dean Molner. Assistant Chief Molner has been a conservation officer for over 23 years. He was first assigned to Clinton County as a field officer before moving up to the ranks to second in charge of the Law Enforcement Division. Dean is often featured on the Ask the DNR segments on public television. Next is Brent Rudolph, the DNR Deer and Elk Program Leader. Brent has worked for the DNR for more than 13 years. He is an accomplished deer researcher and is currently completing his PhD at Michigan State University. Our final uh, panel uh, panelist is Dr. Steve Schmidt, the state wildlife veterinarian. Uh, Steve has worked for the DNR for nearly 35 years and is internationally recognized for his outstanding work on a variety of wildlife diseases, including bovine tuberculosis. So feel free to post a question and I will ask the experts the questions right here. We're gonna start with Brent with some opening remarks. Brent? Thanks, um, this is a new experience for all of us. <laughs> I think we're uh, looking forward to this this evening, but uh, hopefully folks will bear with us if we have any glitches as we go. Uh, this is a real exciting time of year for all of us in the department uh, and for deer hunters, <coughs> especially in Michigan, obviously. We've had, you know, we get close to 700,000 people by uh, license to hunt deer in Michigan each year almost 10 million days are spent by deer hunters in the field every year from from one season to the next that's about 300,000 archery hunters around 600,000 hunt with a firearm and 200,000 with a muzzleloader um, so all of us with our various capacities in the department are pretty big busy this time of year but it's a great time of year to be a, to be a hunter and, and a deer hunter here in Michigan um, you know we see in Michigan and Surveys all around the country show there's lots of reasons that people deer hunt. Uh, many of the top reasons are just to be able to spend time outdoors, spend time with friends and family, uh, get away from things for a while. Mm. But obviously being a successful uh, deer hunter is important to a lot of folks as well. So we try and provide resources through, uh, through the website, through local meetings, uh, and through new tools like this to give people the best information available about what to expect for their season, uh, regulations, and other things. So. Thanks everybody for joining us here tonight. We look forward to uh, helping answer some of those questions. And okay. uh, Dr. Schmidt? Yes, I'd, I'd like to mention a, a disease that's uh, affecting uh, deer mainly in uh, southwestern Michigan. It's called epizootic hemorrhagic disease. This is a disease that's caused by a virus and it affects primarily deer, either mule deer or white-tailed deer. Uh, it can only be transmitted by a small biting uh, fly, we call it a midge. These guys are small, about one-third to one-half the size of a black fly. Uh, as I mentioned, that's the only way it can be transmitted. It can't be transmitted directly from one deer to another. And uh, people cannot get this disease, e even if they were bitten by a, a midge that uh, was carrying the virus or eating venison from a deer that was infected uh, with the disease. Uh, this disease has been around uh, for a long time, uh, at least 100 years. Uh, and it's caused uh, die-offs in uh, states uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, mainly in the, uh, the Southern states, the Western states. And uh, it's, uh, but it was um, not a, a disease that we would see uh, very much in the Upper Great Lakes states or the, uh, New England uh, states. And the reason for that is uh, it was just too darn cold for the uh, larval stage to survive the winter and the summers weren't warm enough for the population to build up to the level that you needed to uh, cause uh, die-offs. Uh, that started changing oh, about a decade ago. We are seeing warmer winters, uh, we're seeing hotter summers, and the, uh, the midge population has been able to build up uh, to the level that it's caused die-offs. We've seen die-offs six out of the last seven states and, uh, years, and. Uh, this particular year, in 2012, we've had a, a die-off that uh, we've diagnosed the disease in uh, 30 counties, and we have over 13,000 deer that have died. And uh, it's not something that we've uh, seen just in, uh, 
in Michigan. Uh, 33 uh, states have reported EHD die-offs uh, this year. It's likely to be the, the biggest uh, uh, die-off uh, due to EHD uh, in the United States uh, ever. Uh, the things to remember is that uh, you know it's something that has occurred before in other states. Uh, it will reduce the deer population in a local area quite significantly. Uh, but those uh, deer populations o always rebounded, and we should see the same uh, thing here in Michigan. And with that, I'll hand it over to, uh, to Dean. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, as Brent said earlier, uh, hunting in Michigan is a very popular sport, and it's also a very safe sport. We not only want our folks out there to have a successful hunt, but we want you to have a safe hunt, too. Uh, a few reminders about safety for this fall this season. You know, last year we had 12 hunting accidents for the whole entire hunting season from start uh, in October, or actually September, all the way through the end of the year. This year we've had 10 so far. A few things to remember is your hunter's orange. You know, the law requires you, when you're hunting with a firearm, to use a hat, cap, vest, or jacket of highly visible hunter's orange. Now, another one is when tree stands. Uh, this time of year especially, I came down from northern Michigan today, and we have some snow up there and some ice. You know, if you're climbing up ladders, especially those that are metal, be uh, careful about having, you know, slips and falls. And then also, a real important one is when you're bringing your firearm up uh, this season, make sure that it's unloaded and you use a rope to bring it up or down. A lot of our accidents that we have throughout the hunting seasons are self-inflicted. So that comes to my third one I want to talk about, and that's watch where you are pointing your firearm. Be sure that it's been being pointed in a safe uh um, direction and not at yourself or one of your hunting partners and then finally make sure that when you do plan to shoot you make sure of your game and the target beyond that so again we want folks to have a successful mm -hmm. season but we also want you to have a very safe season thank you gentlemen a lot of good information already now the uh, questions are already starting to flow uh, we're going to start with you Brent uh, what is the deer forecast for each of the regions uh, very good we have um each year we have kind of a tradition of putting out a forecast from the department. Um, this year we had that time in you know, late October, uh, early November to go out. That's the time when really the uh, archery season is getting pretty uh, fast and furious around that time. There's a lot of deer movement activity happening. Um, and folks can go to uh, our deer website, um, michigan.gov forward slash deer. They'll find that 2012 Michigan deer hunting status and prospects report there. Uh, the key is we look at region by region trends overall. Um, in the Upper Peninsula, we've had three really mild winters in a row, particularly snowfall levels that have accumulated have been pretty low. Um, and snow and, and that, that winter time is a big limiting factor on, on deer in that region. So with those mild conditions, we've continued to see numbers in much of the UP continue to increase. Um, condition of deer should be good, deer numbers should be good. Um, and again, it really comes down to where they are when you're out and about. So look at um, things like impacts that drought may have had on uh, mass conditions. If there's not acorns or berries or things that typically draw deer to your spot this year, um, might need to adjust your strategy a little bit. We've seen very similar things in the northern lower peninsula. Again, three pretty mild winters in a row there. Um, numbers have been a little bit mixed. Some areas they have come up quite a bit in the last few years. Others they've been a little bit slow. So um, Again, we expect folks should have a pretty good season overall. They need to key in on their local area and figure out what's going to work in their, in their strategy on their location. Um, as Steve mentioned, the big thing in southern Michigan that's kind of the wild card for folks is uh, epizootic hemorrhagic disease or EHD. Uh, we've seen deer numbers in the southern region stabilize over about the last five to ten years or so. Um, you know, from about the mid-80s until early 2000, they'd been on a rise. So every year was, was as good or better than the last. And, that's kind of tapered off a little bit in recent years. Uh, numbers are still uh, good and, and hunting opportunities are obviously uh, great for folks in, in our region down here. Um, but if you happen to be right in an area with one of these EHD outbreaks, you should expect to see quite a few uh, less deer. Um, we've been updating a map with uh, about the townships where those outbreaks have occurred. That'll give folks an idea about where to uh, maybe expect to see fewer. Uh, but the big thing is that can even vary at a scale of just a few miles down the road where um, major die-offs in some location may be a little bit further away in, in another spot that uh, there's very little difference that you'll note. Um, so take the time, hopefully folks have taken the time to do a little bit of scouting and preparation. Think about how to have a safe season there as you're in the midst of doing that. 
um, and take a look at the forecast, some, some more of the information we have region by region, and, and uh, look at adjusting your strategy uh, for your area to put yourself in a good situation where you're hunting. Thank you, Brent. A question now for Dean. Can you explain what species are covered by the mentored youth license? Sure, AJ. Uh, this year is our second year for our mentored uh, youth program. Uh, those uh, youth under the age of nine and under can purchase a license, and that entitles them for $7.50. They can uh, small game hunt. They can hunt turkey both fall and spring. They get two deer tags, a combo license with two tags. They can trap fur bears, and they can also fish, all for the low price of $7.50. That's, you know, that's a, been a, a pretty neat program. You think about mentoring kids into hunting, and you mentioned all those species you can hunt. If you're a, a mentor yourself, you're buying one of those licenses, you're going to buy one of those licenses for, for a youth each time around under the old system, and it adds up quite a bit. We've got a lot of people that are really eager to get people out hunting and have a good, you know, successful first early experience, and that's a great way you get a lot of opportunity for, you know, for, for one price. Right, so you're absolutely, absolutely right, right, Brent. And we sold over 9,000 licenses so far this year. Great. In fact, I had an opportunity to take my two grandsons, two of my grandsons, down mm -hmm. and buy their first license this past mm -hmm. Saturday. So, neat experience. Good, Good stuff. Yeah. We're going to pick on you on the same subject. At what age can a youth hunter start sitting in their own blind while their parent is in another blind on the same property? Okay, on the same property, it's for any place, whether it's on public or private land, if you're under the age of 17, 16 and down, you have to have a parent or legal guardian um, at least 18 years of age or older with you. Now, they do not have to sit in the same blind, okay, but they have to be able to come to the visual or verbal aid to that other hunter, the youth hunter. Now, what does that mean? Uh, that's unrestricted uh, visual and verbal aid. It cannot be by the use of a walkie-talkie or cell phones or anything like that. Uh, you have to be able to see the youth that you're um, out with and be able to come to their aid if they signal you either verbally or visually. Okay, thank you. Steve, a question for you. Is bovine TB still a problem in the state? Uh, yes, it is. I hate to say that. Uh, and by the way, we're the only place in the world where bovine tuberculosis has become established in their deer herd. That's in northeastern Michigan. And uh, we've basically been rewriting the book since 1995 that we realized that the disease was established in the deer herd. Uh, we, uh, the disease is the disease of cattle, spilled over into the deer, and now it's spilling back from the deer into the cattle. We average about one to two positive cattle herds a year. We've had 55 total herds infected uh, since 1998. Uh, we have made a lot of progress, both on the cattle side and on the deer side. Uh, we reduced prevalence in the deer from about 5% down to 1.2% uh, last year, but we still have a long ways to go. It will take decades for us to eradicate the disease. In what ways, Steve, uh, are the hunters helping to eradicate TB? Uh, the hunters are very important in uh, the management of this disease. Uh, the two things that uh, we are trying to do uh, are to reduce the deer herd, that's to keep you know, the deer density down, uh, and then also to keep deer from concentrating around feeding and baiting sites. Those are the two reasons why the disease would be able to become established. It, uh, that in increases the transmission rate and makes it a transmit more efficiently. And, and so what we're trying to do is reverse that uh, by asking hunters to harvest antlers deer. Uh, and they've done a, a pretty good job of that. And then also to abide by the feeding and baiting band in northeastern Michigan. If they do that, uh, you know, over time, we should have a, a chance of reducing the, the prevalence even more. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Brent, a question for you. What, what are the deer advisory teams that I keep hearing about? Oh, good. Um, we, uh, the Wildlife Division and, and the Department mm -hmm. of Natural Resources uh, created a deer advisory team in each region of the state, so the Upper Peninsula, uh, Northern Lower Peninsula, and Southern Lower Peninsula. Um, again, you can find information on our, on our deer website that I mentioned uh, at regional deer advisory teams. There's a link on that uh, further down the page. Um, it's really our effort to have kind of an engaged, informed uh, mechanism to get input from the deer hunting community directly to uh, the division and the department about what they'd like to see for, for deer, in, uh, deer management in their various regions. So we have uh, at least two meetings a year with uh, each of those teams. Um, to get together and review information. We spend a lot of time reviewing data and uh, trends and things that, that our own managers are looking mm -hmm. at on an annual basis. They have an interest in things like bovine tuberculosis. We bring folks in as, as necessary to give them uh, the best information we have available. Um, and then get 
recommendations from them as to uh, things they'd like to see us implement in the DEER program. So um, it's been something that's still uh, gaining momentum and um, um, providing this, this new mechanism for folks that either represent organizations or are just kind of uh, interested deer hunters from those regions to provide input to us. Um, if folks are, are interested, we always provide information through that deer advisory team link about when and where meetings are coming. Uh, we can't accommodate everybody that wants to come, maybe sit down at the table and talk, but folks can at least come and, and observe and hear the discussions and be part of it. Um, folks from law enforcement division, uh, forest management division, other resource managers in the state are, are uh, you know, a part of those meetings as well. Well, and Brent, too, you know that uh, members of the deer advisory team also serve on the bovine TB advisory committee. So uh, it works That's both right. ways and a uh, very, very good uh, system. Yeah, right. Yep. Brent, how do, how do the hunters help pay for Michigan wildlife? Uh, well, there's, a key, there's a couple key things. You know, one of, the, one of the things we've been pointing out to folks mm -hmm. this year, uh, 2012 uh, marked the 75th anniversary of the Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act, um, or Pittman-Robertson Act, or a lot of times people might hear of PR or PR monies. Um, that's a program that, that directs funds from federal taxes on archery equipment, uh, firearms, ammunition, and so forth back to state wildlife agencies to pay for wildlife conservation, um, and pay for hunter education and other key mm -hmm. activities that we, uh, that we do at, at the state level. Um, what happens is basically 75 cents out of every dollar that we spend on those activities uh, comes from this source of revenue. So hunters, as they're buying their equipment, mm -hmm. uh, create that source of money that comes uh, back to the states through the federal government. Um, as we have people buying hunting licenses, they provide a, a key part for the other 25 cents on those dollars um, to pay right from the revenue of those licenses. And uh, the amount of PR money each state gets depends upon the number of hunters you have. So as we keep a good strong hunting uh, base here in Michigan, we'll continue to get a good portion of those uh, funds. Historically, Michigan's um, done a pretty good job at, at uh, getting that, that money here to help us with our uh, important natural resources here. Since 1937, PR has provided more than uh, $262 million um, to Michigan for wildlife management. So PR dollars and uh, hunting license dollars are, are a big part of what we can do for all types of wildlife, whether they're game species or otherwise here in the state. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Lorne on Facebook, a question for Dean. Can I use a 22 to hunt small game during the deer season? Uh, the answer would be that no, not during the firearm deer season from the 15th to the 30th. Uh, the only person that could go out and use a 22 rim fire, uh, it would be somebody that's uh, harvesting fur bears under a fur bears license and they can have a 22 of field only at the, loaded only at the point of kill if they have to put an animal out. Um, that's a good question because in southern Michigan, of course, we're in a shotgun zone and in the mm -hmm. northern, lower and the upper peninsula, we're in the uh, rifle zone. And you can use any caliber rifle that you want, but it has to be a center fire rifle, not a rimfire. Okay, thank you, Dean. Uh, question for Steve again. Uh, will the deer herd recover from the EHD uh, disease and, and how? Uh, yes, it will. As, as I mentioned, uh, this disease has been going on in many states uh, in the United States uh, for decades. and. Uh, it always, the deer population is always rebounded, even if it was uh, severely reduced in a, in a localized area. Uh, we're talking that, uh, you know, as many as 50% of the deer in a, in a small area. When I talk of small area, I'm talking, you know, township or smaller size area. Uh, usually along streams, uh, lakes, ponds, uh, and the reason for that is that's where these midges uh, live and uh, there, that's where you'll have your most severe uh, mortality. But uh, in, I have all the confidence in the world that uh, the deer numbers will come back like they have in all the other states that have had these die-offs. Uh, and uh, one reason that I, I can say that is that these, the, a number of the deer, a, a fairly high percentage of deer that become infected will not actually have show the disease. They'll have uh, either mild symptoms or there are no symptoms at all. Those deer uh, produce antibodies which will protect them in future years and the does that are infected that survive will actually pass that immunity on to their, uh, their uh, fawns. And that's where the states to the south of us that have the virus circulating 
almost every year, a high percentage of their population is immune uh, to the disease. Doctor, thanks. Brian, a question uh, again back from Facebook. Why not shut the entire antl ant uh, antlerless season down due to EHD, if sure. needed? Uh, yeah, we've had, uh, we've had a lot of folks ask about responding um, uh, to some of those outbreaks. Again, as, as Steve mentioned, the real challenge is the uh, scale at which this disease kind of operates. So we took it, take a look at you know, over 13,000 deer now have been reported. That's, that's uh, good hard work by volunteers and, and our field staff to get records compiled and brought in. But um, across those 30 counties, those 13,000 deer are not evenly distributed as to where we've lost them. So in very small areas, lots of deer are dying and have been found. Um, in other areas, you're not seeing many impacts at all. So trying to strike a balance between um, uh, recognizing concerns of the public and we appreciate all their efforts in helping track the disease while realizing there's a lot of areas that are, um, that are far away from where those impacts are. So what we've ended up doing is uh, we were able to we feel really strongly that people that are hunting right around where these impacts are greatest, those hunters will make the right decision. Um, they'll restrain their harvest opportunities. Um, they'll, they'll back off and allow deer numbers to recover here in those future seasons. As, as Steve said, we've always seen them happen uh, in other places where the disease has emerged. Uh, but just last week, a regulation change did come in place in southern Michigan to cap um, antlerless licenses that folks can buy in that region. It kind of provides an umbrella, additional reinforcement of uh, what we think most hunters will do the right thing. We're going to protect some of the opportunities where people might get, you know, too carried away in some of those areas and, and limit the, the number that they're able to buy in those locations. Right. And that follow up on that, Brent, that uh, the commission order changed, or the director's order, I should say, changed it to five. You can know there's a cap of five and basically in uh, zone uh, four, uh, 486. And nine other additional counties is a cap of two. So you want to go to our website. We've got a goods information on it to find out where those counties are that have a limit now of how many you can purchase for the rest of the year. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dean. I'm going to stick with you on a question as well. Uh, when should someone call the ARP line, and what exactly is this? That, that would be the RAP line? The RAP line. Okay, the RAP line. Okay. <laughs> That's the report all poaching uh, hotline at 1-800-292-7800. That's a good opportunity for you folks to be our eyes and ears. The conservation officer out there working diligently following up on your complaints that you're calling in. It's an opportunity for you to, if you see somebody that's violating or you think that they're violating or it's just something suspicious, call it in. You're our eyes and ears. You can help us. Um, we encourage you or we really don't ever want you to get involved in trying to get you know, involved in stopping somebody from doing something. Uh, they're a poacher, they're a thief, they're a criminal. And we want you to get information for us, uh, write down license numbers, uh, vehicle descriptions, descriptions of the people in that, call us in. That is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation dispatch center right here in Lansing that has radio communication with all the SEALs across the state. So if you see something that you think may not be right or you know it's not right, give us a call at 1-800-292-7800. Dean, I was also going to add in there, we have uh, basically wildlife CSI in the lab, we not only do disease work, Absolutely. but we do forensic work. And so uh, some of the Dean's conservation officers will bring a, a deer in to us and want to know cause of death. Uh, sometimes there's an arrow in it and there's a bullet in it and it's been run over by a car. And you have to figure out, okay, which happened first and uh, you know, what, uh, what uh, you know, are you going to cut, put down as the cause of death? And then you actually go to trial. Uh, on these. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Steve and his staff are a big <laughs> service to us to be able to help solve some of those more puzzling <laughs> cases. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Brian, another question for you. What uh, from Facebook, uh, what is the purpose of the free crossbow stamp? Oh, good question, yeah. So we've had, um, in the last few years, we've had some expanded opportunities for hunters to use crossbows during the archery season uh, in Michigan. Um, when the regulations came in place to allow that opportunity, a uh, free stamp was created as a way to uh, identify people that would be using those to go afield. We wanted to look at participation, look at what kind of effects they had um, long term on uh, maybe getting new hunters involved or getting, getting hunters uh, expanding the opportunities that they have uh, to hunt in different seasons uh, and attract the harvest specifically that was added when the, when the crossbows became available. Um, one thing we did find, though, we use a, a mail survey at the end of the year uh, every year to estimate our, our harvest from all the different seasons in all different areas. 
and it became clear not everybody that was um, using the crossbow was 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 getting that stamp. Um, so there's still some conf I think there's still some confusion about it. You are supposed to have a stamp whether if you're going to go afield with a crossbow um, in the archery season. Um, it's it's free, so there's no fee or anything added onto it. Uh, but we need to either help continue to get reduce that confusion and get that word out, um, or eliminate the stamp and just continue to rely on the harvest survey to track some of those participation levels. Yeah, that's uh, something to remember too. A lot of folks are starting, you know, they don't start the season being a crossbow hunter. They kind of maybe mm -hmm. halfway through the season they decide, oh, I'm mm -hmm. going to get a crossbow. Be sure you go back to your license agent and get that free stamp. You know, interestingly enough, in 2009, we had about 47,000 folks get that stamp. This year alone, in 2012, we have 84,493 as of a week ago. Wow. So the, the crossbow popularity is really skyrocketing. It really helps us know how many out, uh, folks are out there using that. So it's real important that you go get that free stamp. Is there any indication of why that's increased so much over the last year? I think a part of it, I mean, we've, we've also um, separately taken a look again at not just the stamp numbers, but mm -hmm. what's our actual estimate of the participation. Last year we grew to about, we, we think just under about 120,000 people um, that actually went out and participated in, in crossbow hunting. For the main thing, for the main part, it's, it's a new opportunity. So um, at first people may not even realize that a change was made. Um, they might not be convinced it's something that they're interested in participating in, but as with anything, it, it experience kind of grows, the word of mouth spreads, people make a decision about whether they want to invest in a new piece of equipment and figure out how it works. Um, so it's not uncommon that it just takes some time, uh, sometimes for folks to uh, get over the hump and, and try that out as something new. I think a lot of it too, AJ, is the fact that um, crossbows when they first came out were folks with disabilities or, you know, if they had, you know, one limbs or bad shoulders. Well, we're seeing a lot of folks that had got out of bow hunting because they just can't pull a traditional bow back anymore. This gets them an opportunity to be able to use a crossbow and get back out into the field and fall. Okay, let's kind of stay on that subject a little bit. Um, another uh, Facebook question. What are the rules for bow hunting during the firearm season, Dean? Okay, uh, during, the bow, during the firearm season, you can use archery equipment. However, you have to follow the uh, firearm rules. And that means that you either have to have a combination deer license or a firearms license, and you have to wear hunter's orange. You can still hunt out of a tree because, of course, we can hunt out of trees now with firearms. But you have to fire, uh, follow the firearm rules, hunter's orange, and have a combo license or a firearms license. Okay, thank you. Brent, um, another question for you off of Facebook. What are the chances that Michigan will go back to the one buck limit, and are the regional deer teams considering this at all? Ah, good question. Yeah, um, the deer advisory teams um, are really kind of open to any of the ideas and, and uh, initiatives that are out there that, that people want to take a look at. Um, I, you know, I want to offer an odds on or off as to whether that's something that's going to be explored or not. Um, we have uh, been going through uh, the Upper Peninsula team in particular, wanted to have a, a review of buck harvest res regulations and restrictions overall. Uh, we have had a, what's called a hunter's choice rule in the Upper mm -hmm. Peninsula where you have a choice of just one buck to take from the UP and it can be um, any antler size. Uh, or if you choose to take two bucks of the UP, you have to have at least three antler points on one side. Um, and anywhere in the state, if you take two bucks, one of them at least has to have four antler points on a side. Um, so that UP team was interested in getting the feedback on what the impacts of that rule have been um, and what some other options, a one buck limit, uh, point restriction, and other things may be. Um, so in um, our, our next meeting with them, we're still working on scheduling that. should be in December or else in ju early January. We'll be providing them with kind of our assessment of, of different alternatives and what the effects might be. Um, and it's really, you know, that, that input mechanism is a way to say we want to hear directly from folks as to what they think we... Uh, might consider then based on our, our, uh, our estimates and, and the things that they weigh in on and, and think about. Um, any rule option, of course, that's one of the reasons we have uh, law enforcement division involved so they can help figure out how to enforce different mm -hmm. restrictions and regulations if there's changes being um, uh, considered. Uh, but it is something that's been a, an active area of interest, whether it's a one buck rule, other things in terms of buck harvest restrictions. So um, it's certainly an area um, that a lot of folks have been looking at along with us. Brent, thanks. Uh, Steve, another question for you. What other diseases do deer usually have and might be seen when gutting a deer? Well, actually deer are pretty disease free when it comes down to it. Uh, you know, the, the bovine tuberculosis that was mentioned earlier, uh, that's something that uh, will cause 
in a, uh, just under half of the TV infected deer. Uh, some chest lesions, uh, these nodules, pea-sized, yellowish colored nodules on the inside of the rib cage or on the, on the lungs. Uh, episodic hemorrhagic disease, uh, that uh, the virus damages the uh, blood vessels and they bleed internally, uh, die very quickly within three to 14 days. Now, hunters aren't gonna be seeing that because once the culicoides uh, midges, uh, die, which they did, you know, in these hard, uh, hard uh, frosts that we've had, uh, transmission stops. And so, uh, but that would be something that would have occurred maybe a, a month ago. Uh, other disease, uh, it's not so much disease, but parasites. There's liver flukes that they can see in the liver. There's some uh, uh, tapeworm uh, parasites uh, they can see in the, uh, in the lungs or the liver. Uh, there's some in intestinal worms. Uh, but that's, well, nose bots, uh, these are big uh, uh, maggot type things you'll see sometimes in the, in the nose. Uh, none of those really cause a problem for the deer and people can't get them. So the, the short answer, I guess, would be that deer are pretty much disease free. There, there's not much uh, for humans to worry about and very few things that kill the deer other than the ones we mentioned, EHD and TB. It's, okay, it's been Thank an interesting you. phenomenon. You know, in recent years, there's a lot more awareness, I think, in the hunting community about yeah. wildlife diseases. It's something mm -hmm. wildlife managers and, mm -hmm. and folks spend a lot more time on than they used to in the past. Um, a lot of times people are seeing something that's mm -hmm. a normal part of deer anatomy yeah. that um, they just never looked as closely on it. So it, it's been really interesting to me to have so many other people coming into a check station wanting to see, uh, hey, take a look at this. Is this something that's happening? And, and we really appreciate it. You know, there's a lot of deer hunters, a lot of deer taken every year. It's a great way for us to help track kind of the, the health of deer overall is those eyes and ears that uh, people see if, if something looks unusual to be contacting us and asking about it. You know, you, you say check stations, and this is one of the things that, you know, we encourage you folks to come in and bring your deer in, just like Brent said, is that uh, we want to get the information on it. We want to get a good numbers and be sure to pick up your successful deer hunters patch while you're doing it. <laughs> Nice Wonderful. Is, is, it, is it important to, I'll ask Brent, is it important to get your deer checked and why isn't it mandatory at this point? Yeah, we, um, we've been operating the check stations and handing out these <laughs> patches <laughs> um, since the uh, early 1970s. 1972, 1972 the first 1972 was yeah. the very first year. Um, it's always been a voluntary system in Michigan. Um, we last year checked, I think, over 30,000 deer that came through a check station, even, even under that voluntary system. So what you'll find is a lot of other states that have um, mandatory registration or something similar to ours, they're bringing a, a deer physically into a place where, where uh, the harvest is being recorded. Um, a lot of those deer aren't being examined by you know, trained staff that, that take data off of them. Many of them are just being recorded as a, a deer that was taken and someone fills off a, a check sheet. Um, so we still managed to, to see about as, as many or more deer uh, physically presented. We get age information off of all those deer brought to a check station. Uh, we take some antler measurements that give us a good indication about condition of deer. Uh, that We can track uh, what the deer health and condition is like mm -hmm. in a different area or how it changes over time. Um, and of course one of the key things other than the patch is all the uh, the great opportunity is to interact with uh, department personnel. So it's one of the rare opportunities where we get a lot of people out on the ground to say, you know, come to us, give us some important information, ask us questions you have, give us your feedback. Well, um, I was going to add in too, one of the other things we've collected, Brent, is uh, DNA information. We've collected DNA uh, information from 55,000 deer around the state, from every county. We can pretty much tell, you know, with the uh, genetics, where a deer came from, what county. And uh, that's helped us, uh, there's some law enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, answers there, plus also from a, a disease standpoint it, that we can say, you know, that that deer was uh, from that particular county, even though, you know, it may have been moved. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, a Facebook question uh, pertaining to law, Dean, if we could have you answer this one. Can I use my dog to track a wounded deer? Right. Mm. You can use, uh, if you're going to use a dog, it has to be on a leash. Um, the people that are involved in the tracking itself um, cannot have any sort of weapon, uh, day or night. Um, if you do want to use a um, blood tracker, uh, this is something that we've had for the last few years, 
You go to bloodtracking.com, I believe it is, and there's a list of um, certified blood trackers. And I was really interested to find out when we had this whole um, presentation at the Natural mm -hmm. Resource Commission, there's a lot of dachshunds mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. phenomenal blood trackers. And I mean, these animals, these dogs are just phenomenal. But yes, the short answer is sure. You can use a dog. Again, it's got to be on a leash. Uh, nobody can possess a firearm when you're tracking it um, unless you have a blood tracker with you and then the person that actually shot the animal that's tracking it can have a firearm with them, but it can't be loaded until the, when they find the animal and point of kill. Okay. Steve, a question for you off of Facebook. We haven't heard much about CWD. What's going on with that? It's still there. Not in Michigan. We uh, no evidence that we have CWD in Michigan, either in our captive deer or in our free-ranging deer. Uh, many of you will remember back in 2008, we had a captive whitetail over in Kent County uh, become inf er, infected with uh, CWD. And we were real concerned about that. Uh, we were concerned that there's a possibility of a spilling from the captive into the uh, free ranging. Uh, but we tested uh, over 3,000 deer in a nine township area around that positive facility and uh, could not find the disease. So we dodged the bullet. But uh, it's still out there. 17 uh, states, two Canadian provinces uh, have uh, CWD in the free ranging deer. In none of those uh, states or provinces where it's become established have been able to eradicate it. In fact, they can't even keep it, uh, you know, manage it. it. The prevalence keeps going up and the disease keeps spreading. So it's one of those diseases, uh, like bovine tuberculosis, that uh, once you have it established in your deer herd, you'll probably have to live with it. You're much better off. EHD will come and go. Uh, but it's not going to be there forever like uh, CWD would. So this, the short answer on CWD is we need to be diligent and uh, need to try to prevent it from coming into the state and becoming established. Okay. Stephen, one, something you and I were talking about earlier today, and we just had a case down in southeast Michigan today, is that if you're going to hunt out of state, you, know, you need to know what state you're hunting in because, as Steve said, there's 17 states that you cannot bring an animal back uh, in the hole or in parts of it unless it is boned out. You can bring the antlers back and a, a clean skull cap so we don't want any brain mm -hmm. matter or anything like that in the state. If you, bring some, if you bring an animal in that isn't properly processed when you bring it in, you will lose your animal. And we have some folks that lose some big trophy bucks because they're bringing it in proper. We need to protect our state in our home state of Michigan so we're very diligent about watching for that coming in. Right, and the reason that only certain tissues can be brought back, we're mainly concerned about nervous tissue, the spinal cord and the brain. That's where the prion, the infectious agent uh, for CWD is. And if that came in, it's been shown in research studies and it's thrown out on the back 40, uh, it, uh, you know, after it disintegrates, it's still in the soil. It's more than a virus or bacteria. This thing is more like a contaminant, like, a, uh, like mercury. And it, it can be in that soil for years, and then a deer feeding on that, particularly if it gets a flush of vegetation from that organic matter uh, decomposing, uh, they can pick that up and become infected. It's been shown th that that happens in uh, research uh, facilities, research pens. So that's the, that's the reason mm -hmm. why you can't bring back uh, that, uh, that whole carcass. Doctor, thanks. Uh, Brent, here's a fair question from Facebook. What are the best natural food sources I can keep uh, or have planted on the property to attract deer and keep them healthy in the winter? So, oak, apple, grains, what do you recommend? Um, you know, that's a very kind of location-specific question. We, um, the challenges that we deal with uh, from deer in, in one end of the state to the other can differ quite a bit. So one of the key things is uh, I'm glad the emphasis was on uh, natural habitat. You know, mm -hmm. good woodlot management yep. is a big part of providing good habitat mm -hmm. um, in Michigan. A lot of times people typically think of that as an up north thing, you know, but there's lots of um, um, aging and maturing forests even in southern Michigan as well. You think about it, deer, you know, can only eat what's within their range to reach. So one of the key things is good young forests that have good forage growing down close to within a deer's range um, is going to provide a, a good nutritious food source for them. Um, certainly things like apples, you know, those, those mast trees and other things are, are providing a good food resource. Um, but how well they produce one year to the next. If anybody's noticed the price of apple cider this year, the apple <laughs> crop was, was pretty bad. So, um, so some of those things are great magnets to be able to draw deer in but they kind of come and go as to how much they're providing for, for uh, forage year-round. 
certainly food plots that are more things that every year you plant and, and grow back in um, can be valuable as well, but providing some type of, of permanent habitat, more permanent cover looking long range on, on woodlot management and other things are, are uh, good directions for folks to be considering to go in. Um, if you don't think you've got enough land you know, on your own to be able to, to do something like this, um, consider working together with your neighbors. Um, it provides a better opportunity for us to maybe be able to provide staff to, to go out and meet with folks, talk about habitat management, talk about harvest yeah. management, population management, so that we get you know, a larger group of people that want to work together uh, with goals and, and provide a better opportunity for us to reach a lot of folks at one time. Well, well also, you know, when you're talking about uh, a young forest, you know, keeping uh, that on your, your property, uh, that's also going to help other game species and non-game species. The first one that comes to mind being a grouse hunter would be grouse. That, yeah. uh, those early successional stages of aspen are very good for them. Not only help deer, help, uh, help grouse. It's one of the key things we, as, as wildlife managers, try and change the, mm -hmm. the viewpoints about. A lot of people mm -hmm. begin to equate, you know, cutting, cutting trees is bad. They see that as an mm -hmm. impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. But there's even a lot of non-game species yeah. that are really declining in a lot of areas of the country because young forests, you know, people have that idea. It's good to have um, old growth and mature forests mm -hmm. in some places. They play a role. Uh, but if folks are too concerned about thinking it's always bad to, uh, to cut trees down, that's that's having an impact on, on habitat for a whole variety of wildlife species as well. Well, and too, um, if folks are not sure where to get started, you know, we have a lot of information, you know, that we can provide, but if they get involved with whitetails or pheasants or turkey, you know, federation, mm -hmm. all these folks do a lot of habitat mm -hmm. management, yeah. and it's just not for those species. All the species really, you know, um, benefit from that type of management. Yeah, good mm -hmm. point. A lot of good conservation partners. Yep, absolutely. A bunch of them out there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Uh, Dean Lean, uh, Lynn is logged in on Facebook to ask you a question. She has a concealed pistol license. Can she carry that while in the woods, or does she need a hunting license to carry that? No, that's um, here. Uh, uh, concealed pistol, pistol licenses uh, really became popular about oh, about five six years ago. And if you've got a CPL license, then you can you carry that under your CPL license. Um, it, you do not need a hunting license. It's uh, two separate issues. Mm -hmm. Now, the one question I know I get quite often is, I'm an archer hunter and I'm up in my tree, can I have my concealed uh, pistol with me? And the answer is yes, if you're properly licensed, it's you may. The caution is that you cannot use that pistol in any, any shape, form of uh, finishing the yeah. game off right. or taking the game, but you can carry it for protection, you can carry it under that license with no problem. During the firearm deer season, if you, um, again, it's not a center fire, rifle, center fire 22, if you're in an area and you want to you know, finish your deer off with it, then you can use that because it's a legal firearm at that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brent, um, another Facebook question for you. What, what are winter deer yards, and can you explain deer migration patterns in the uh, UP and what triggers migration? Sure. Um, well, it's, a, it's not a simple question, but basically, mm -hmm. you know, we see the, the dates on which deer move from, from what we call summer range, mm -hmm. um, into winter range, they can vary from usually late November, but sometimes uh, on into to early February. Uh, but really the key thing that trig triggers it is the, the winter conditions that year. Um, in a given area across the, the Great Lakes, you know, the Northern Great Lakes states, any, anywhere from I think about 60 to 90% of deer are migratory. Um, basically, if they're in an area that come winter time, the snow begins to accumulate and they don't have cover to basically provide some, uh, some security from that. They've got to leave to some place where they can find it. Um, now, a lot of folks will know some traditional migration mm -hmm. routes, and, and there's a lot of information. Again, you look at late November on into December when the muzzleloader season and so forth are getting on in, in the Upper Peninsula and, and, and Northern Lower Peninsula, you'll often see that, um, that movement start. But which way they go and how far they go is kind of a, a random scattering. The interesting thing about deer is they have um, a lot of uh, repeat use on their spring and summer habitat. Does especially go mm -hmm. back to the place where they uh, have fawns every year. They're pretty predictable as to locations in that in that regard. Uh, but then whether they migrate, where they migrate, it depends on the winter weather. Um, and um, and the direction seems to be something that was struck on long ago and is kind of passed down through generations of deer. Um, so in some instances, you may find deer on neighboring spring or summer habitat and, and summer 
heading this way to, to winter range and going 30 miles and some are heading this way to winter range and going just five miles um, and it's kind of a, a random scattering around that time of year. Um, so the key thing is for the most part deer require some of that cover. It keeps, uh, it keeps uh, snow from accumulating on the ground. It makes where it can be harder for them to walk and, and get through. Um, it can provide some shelter from wind in, in cold seasons uh, or in particularly cold times in the winter. Um, and although having some food nearby can be important, um, if you, th you think about a deer almost kind of uh, hibernate on their feet in some ways in, in winter time, their metabolism gears down and for at least the core winter months they can withstand some pretty rough conditions and still make it. Um, uh, but early into the year, uh, early into the winter and late into the winter, if there's tough conditions there, it's going to be a hardest uh, deer making it through. Um, I think um, we do have in, in late 2010, we summarized a uh, kind of a report talking about some of the different conditions for deer habitat and how it varies around the state. Uh, we do have it posted on our website. We'll look at getting the link up uh, on there later on. It's, um, um, it's habitat and behavior of wintering deer um, in northern Michigan or, or something to that effect. Um, we've got a pretty good library of, of wildlife division reports that provide more details on these kinds of issues. In disease management, you need to take in deer movements and uh, you know, deer yarding areas, there's a concentration area. So any plan, whether it's our chronic wasting disease response plan or our TB management plan, take those things in consideration. Yeah, some of those scales of movement, mm -hmm. right, that can exactly. be different different mm -hmm. areas of the state. We get that information from radio collar and deer and seeing how far they move. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dean, another question for you off of Facebook. I, I have a ladder stand on state land marked with my name and address. Can I leave it up year round? No, you cannot. Um, and again, uh, good that you have it marked with your name and address because any permanent blind that's set out in the woods uh, because a constructed blind or a pop-up blind or a, a ladder stand has to have your name on it. You can put your ladder stand out starting September 1st, but you have to have it out of the woods by March 1st. A um, couple different reasons, especially on public properties. Of course, that's, that's on public properties. You know, we do have logging operations going on and we don't want people establishing turf year round. So you can take it, you can put it out early, well before the season, and you can take it down well after the season, but you do need to bring it down. Okay, thank you. Steve, uh, does EHD affect adult deer more than fawns? What about bucks versus does? Yeah, that's a good so question. I sh should have mentioned that earlier probably. It's what we call an all age, either sex die off for the deer that are affected. And that means that the young and the old, the males and the females all die at the same rate. And of course, that's particularly those, some of those mature bucks are what really, uh, when those animals die, when uh, the, the hunters or the landowner has been following it on his trail camera and, uh, you know, be getting excited as the hunting season approaches and all of a sudden he finds it dead on the property. It's a, you know, that's a real shame. Yeah. What, what uh, another question along those lines, what should I do if I find a dead deer on my property that I suspect died of EHD? Do you still want it reported to you? Yes, we do. Uh, we were testing deer down to what we called the, the township, the six mile by six mile area. If we had a positive deer from that area, uh, laboratory, you know, confirmed positive, then we didn't need to test anymore. But we still want deer uh, reported so we can, you know, see the extent, you know, how wide and then, you know, the number. So, yeah, please report them. Even now, I mentioned earlier in the program that uh, basically transmission for EHD is shut down. Uh, there's, you know, the majority of the deer that are going to die from it have already died. Uh, but still, give us a call and we can take those numbers. And for, that's one of the things actually at the check stations this year, we're going to be asking hunters if they saw a deer, uh, you know, that uh, died, particularly uh, along a stream or, you know, the edge of water. That's what you're typically going to find. And if, if they did, uh, did you already report it? And if, if they did, then that's fine. But if they didn't, we'll add that into the, uh, the total number of the estimated uh, mortality. Yeah, it's good to point that out. This this time of year, obviously, you're going to have some wounding loss of, mm -hmm. of deer mm -hmm. that are shot and, 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 and die elsewhere. Um, of course, late October, early November is a big time mm -hmm. for deer moving and getting hit by cars as right. well. So one of the key things now we've reminded folks of is still some of the key things to look for if you see multiple deer mm -hmm. in a relatively yeah. small location. 
in, in or around water because some folks will be going back to their hunting spot. They haven't been out there you know, earlier in the summer where the, the outbreak was really occurring. Um, but those are some of the things to be on, on the lookout for. If you see one deer on your property, it may or may not be EHD. There's a lot of different things that could, that could account for that. Yeah. And the acute phase of the disease I was talking about, that's where you get that internal hemorrhage. There's a chronic phase that, that fewer deer are affected with this, but it can, they're going to have uh, hoof lesions, they're going to have interruptions or even sloughing of the hooves, usually all four uh, feet uh, hooves are involved. Uh, plus you can also have some scarring in the rumen. And those are animals that will go down slowly over a period of time and you start to get into the winter months, December, January, you know, will die of malnutrition. But one of the other things, you know, brought up earlier, uh, disease was chronic wasting disease. And so a thin deer could be due to chronic wasting disease. It could be due to this chronic uh, phase of the uh, of EHD or any number of other diseases. So the most important thing is to, you know, contact the DNR. Uh, we're happy if you bring that uh, deer carcass into a check, st uh, either check station or DNR office. They'll send it down to our lab here at MSU and uh, we can uh, come up with a diagnosis. That's how you find uh, these diseases. And early detection is important, particularly with the diseases like chronic wasting disease. So one of the things that, gentlemen, that I've figured out, uh, obviously, tonight, is that you do rely on the public for some of the data that you do have. Oh, yeah. um, uh, Brent, a question for you. Wh how does the DNR estimate the deer population? Um, good question. We have, you know, there's a variety of tools we try and make available. One of the key things to keep in mind is that um, we have a lot of field staff with uh, more information place to place in different areas of the state. They play a big role in mm -hmm. um, helping to, to monitor deer populations, um, take public input for that matter as well. Um, people in my position mm -hmm. here often work with those folks to look at the most um, recently available tools to you know, use computer models and other things to track numbers, but a big part of it also is, is having awareness about those um, conditions in, in each of their individual areas. So whether it's generating population estimates hmm. or generating recommendations for season regulations and other things, um, our field staff play a big role in, in starting that process and then um, providing some of those recommendations in to folks that are, are working at more of a program level. Um, a key part in, in all that as well, we've mentioned a couple of times our Natural Resources mm -hmm. Commission mm -hmm. um, and uh, folks that aren't aware, we've got a seven member panel um, of, uh, of individuals appointed to the Natural Resources mm -hmm. Commission that actually have the authority to set hunting regulations. Um, another key part of public input is the meetings that they have on a monthly basis. So um, some of these tools like this forum here provide a great way for us to have people that are interested in being engaged to learn more about some of these processes. Uh, we encourage uh, folks to continue to investigate, learn how they might um, want to have a role in providing some of those uh, perspectives and input to field staff or natural resources commissioners or others. Okay, thank you. Dean, a question for you off of Facebook. Uh, I'm thinking about going to college to become a conservation officer. What courses or majors would you recommend, and what is the job outlook and recruiting process like? <laughs> There's a lot to that question. Okay. Um, don't have really good recommendation as far as the classes, um, a combination of law enforcement and biology, whether it's mm -hmm. fisheries or wildlife. Um, things to do with the outdoors uh, would, be, would be good classes, um, even business management. Um, you're looking at, uh, let's see, prospect. Um, we're hoping to be able to start hiring some conservation officers in the near future. Um, you know, we, I, we have an ongoing recruiting program that I would suggest that you go to our website and go to the law enforcement uh, page and we've got a lot of information on there how to become a conservation officer and what the recruiting process is. We've got a really good video there uh, called the Shields of Gold that we actually produced in-house that gives you a good overview of what a conservation officer does and what their job entails when they're, when they're working out um, outside. We do an awful lot of work with the public as far as education so even any of those backgrounds will help you throughout the recruiting process. I would encourage you again to go to, the, go to our website. Uh, there's a contact information number there for you to uh, call our recruiting uh, center. Once you read all the information, give us a call at our, our training and the rec uh, recruitment uh, center and we'll help to answer your specific questions and do anything we can to help you further your career. Yeah, and expand that out a little bit broader. I know, you know, a lot of people are interested in becoming wildlife biologists yep. in, 
Uh, also, we have people call the lab and want to, you know, do something in wildlife disease, either wildlife veterinarian or technician or something. And we usually try to find a, a spot for them to volunteer, you know, for a few days, maybe longer, to get a little experience, a little idea what exactly we're doing. And that would give them an idea, does that, you know, hey, I don't like this at all, or, you know, I would uh, think about making a career of this. And so that helps him out a little bit, because I, I think most of us, you know, had a little bit of that help, uh, you know, when we were, you know, younger. <laughs> For me, much younger. <laughs> <laughs> starting out. Yeah, starting out. <laughs> Uh, Brent, a uh, three-part question here for you. Okay. What is the Pure Michigan Hunt? Where does the money go? And where can we apply? Oh, good. Yeah, it's, we've had the Pure Michigan Hunt available for several years now. Essentially, hmm. think of like the, the ultimate license, uh, hunting license lottery uh, jackpot. Um, the, the Pure Michigan Hunt essentially hmm. gives you an opportunity to apply for all of our limited ent entry hunts at the same time. Um, so individuals need to be able to, to purchase um, hunting, legally purchase, you know, Michigan mm -hmm. hunting licenses if they're going to be able to be drawn. Uh, but a $4 application, um, as many times as you want to apply, you can apply multiple times. It's the only thing that's like that out there. Um, gives you those, those opportunities to be drawn. Um, ultimately then, I think it's the licenses are then reduced to just $3 if you're drawn for it. Um, there's also... Um, Quite a bit of equipment donated from a number of partners that provide uh, the, the lucky winner mm -hmm. some new equipment to use in their season. Um, and you, get an, you have the opportunity to buy an elk tag, uh, a bear, a spring turkey, a fall turkey, uh, an antlerless deer license. Uh, you also have your pick of hunting at uh, any managed waterfowl, uh, uh, managed waterfowl area during the reserved hunt periods that we have for those. Um, as far as where the money goes, same story as we mentioned earlier, um, that basically that's another source of license revenue. It's another opportunity for us to keep a good engaged um, hunting public to, to be eligible for our Pitt and Robertson funds for matching dollars. Um, so it's going into things like uh, managing habitat, um, helping with hunter education and other activities um, here in Michigan um, that, that benefit all our natural resources. Okay, thank you, Brent. Uh, Dean, a, a question that was really hot, uh, the subject was hot uh, over the summer, obviously. Um, what about feral swine? What type of license do I need? Uh, for feral swine, you need some sort of a hunting license, uh, whether it's a small game or if it's a big game license. You just need to have a hunting license to be able to field. The only difference is you, uh, for the firearm deer season, the 15th to the 30th of November, you must have a, either a combination license or a firearm deer license to be able to legally be a field. So we encourage folks that if they're seeing feral swine that they call it in to our, we have a feral swine number on our website, be sure you call your sightings in. And of course there's also some reporting requirements. Mm -hmm. If somebody does uh, take a swine, you want to be sure that you follow re uh, reporting requirements also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Brent, um, uh, why doesn't the deer opener start on a Saturday instead of a work day? <laughs> <coughs> well, Saturday is a work day for some people. Yeah, yeah that's true. Not for everybody. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, and every opening day is a work day for us. But uh, it's a good question. We get uh, there's not a year that goes by that we don't have people asking about mm -hmm. making a, a change. Uh, certainly, a big part of it is tradition. Um, in, in Michigan, the November fifteenth day yeah. is is looked at as such a strong tradition. Um, Wisconsin, actually, a couple years ago, they have a Saturday opener. I think it was actually November 15th that they proposed for a while changing to, and they had a lot of hunters go up in arms about not yes, wanting to did. change from their traditions there. So certainly deer hunting has a lot of traditions that go with it, and in Michigan that, that day for opening day is a big part of it. Uh, but we have looked um, over the years, even though it's, it's one of the things, one of the few things you can get the vast majority of deer hunters to agree on is they really like that, that opening uh, structure. Um, there's a couple different reasons why a Saturday uh, has been proposed. Um, one of them, though, is... A lot of people say, well, you might get more people traveling to northern Michigan and, and helping out those rural economies there. It's a big part of our, uh, our natural resource-based economy here in this state. Um, but we actually see, you know, this year's a Thursday opener, um, and that's often some of the times where we get the most number of days hunted in some mm -hmm. of those northern communities. Folks can take a day or two off. Um, they'll go north, um, mm -hmm. hunt for mm -hmm. a few days, extend it on into the weekend. Um, so, you know, if we wanted to say we really want to emphasize the rural economy in some of those areas, we'd, we'd actually fix it on like a, a Thursday or, a, or even a Wednesday opening. Um, Saturday, we do typically see the number of licenses bought are the highest. Um, so that, that's good for, you know, revenue coming in for wildlife management. 
Um, but again, the number of hunter days is often not as high. People hunt a day or two and, and they don't get back out again after it's on a weekend. Um, so it's one of the things we continue to gather a lot of information about every year, but uh, tradition so far has been a big part of it um, and, uh, and something that we think people will be looking forward to again this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I've got a personal question. Can I get you guys to come back? Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> right. Sure. Thanks well, for having us. Thank you. Us. Thank you for participating to everybody that joined us this evening in the DNR live event. We hope this segment was helpful. I'd like to thank our panel, uh, Steve Schmidt, uh, Brent Rudolph, also uh, Dean Molner. And for additional information, you can visit the DNR website at michigan.gov forward slash DNR. Or for door, uh, deer information specifically, check out uh, www.michigan.gov forward slash deer. Thank you again for participating. We wish you a safe and successful hunting season and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.